All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Come on in. Yeah, thanks for making it out. Uh, yeah, well, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Jackson. I'm a professor in the physics department. I think most of you know me, but you know, it's nice to introduce. Um, I teach astronomy. Um, you're here at the first Friday astronomy event. Welcome. Uh, these are monthly lectures that take place uh, on the first Friday of every month, 7.30 p.m. mountain time. Um, they're They've been in this room for the last couple of semesters. I, I don't think we'll move from here anytime soon. So if it's if it's the first Friday of the month um, and you're looking for a cheap date, like this is it. <laughs> this is the place. Um, so uh, important to say, this is an entirely donation supported program. Um, all the money we use to fly folks in, put them up in hotels, pay for food, all that comes from you all. So thank you very much. This is your program. If uh, this is the kind of program that you want to support, um, visit the website, boi.st slash astrogive, or you can scan this QR code. That'll take you to our donation page and you can make a donation. Um, these events are always live streamed and recorded to YouTube. So um, if you missed last month's or you want to see the show from a, a year ago, you can go to the YouTube live stream uh, website and actually watch previous presentations. Um, the live stream is available at, at boi.st slash Astro Broncos Live. Or again, you can scan this QR code. Um, we're going to talk about the solar eclipse tonight. I hope, I hope you're excited to hear about that. Um, you can also visit our eclipse page here, boi.st slash eclipse, or scan the QR code. Um, there's another program that comes up uh, that's going to come up later this month, and I would like to have our guest speaker tell you about that. Where do you go? There you go. Yeah, I guess in reality, I too am offering a cheap date option. So, you know, I think we could start a start a little service here. Uh, I'm Benjamin Satterwhite. I'm the director of the Planetarium here in town. If you didn't know, we had one. It's a good time. Uh, we are the Julius Jaker Planetarium. We're out in Capitol High School up on uh, Crossroads or Milwaukee and Goddard. If you just look up Capitol High School, you can also search Julius Jaker Planetarium. Uh, we got maps. We got contact information there. Basically, we jumped on the bandwagon. We do Third Thursday, free planetarium show. Uh, come on out. We'll show you what to see for the next month. Have a little bit of topical business along with it. We do a kid's show at 6.30, a lot of eye candy and some art and stuff. Uh, and then uh, adult shows, 7.30 to 8.30, much quieter than the kid's show. Uh, so come on out. Uh, we'd be happy to have you. We've got a weird schedule this year, but we should be uh, working pretty good every third Thursday of the month. So come on out. Thank you, Brian. All right. Okay, well, I'm in the unusual position to be both your host and your speaker this evening. <laughs> Those of you who have attended the uh, first Friday in the past know that we usually do introductions and so uh, for our speaker. So I'll give you a quick introduction for myself. Um, I was a graduate student in the planetary sciences department at the University of Arizona. Um, it, actually a very famous planetary sciences department was started uh, during the Apollo era, as NASA was realizing that they needed scientists to help guide the Apollo missions, um, they basically went to George Kuiper, who was a professor at University of Chicago, and said, uh, Professor Kuiper, would you like to start a planetary science program somewhere? And he said, of course, sure. <laughs> so he started the planetary science program at the University of Arizona. It's the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. They run a bunch of missions now. The OSIRIS-REx mission is run out of LPL, um, the Mars high-rise camera which is on uh, part of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiters run out of LPL. So it's a really great program. I was very fortunate to be a graduate student there. Um, before that, I was a, an undergraduate at Georgia Tech. I'm a rambling rat from Georgia Tech. Any Georgia Techers? No? Wrong part of the country, maybe. Um, uh, physics major there. Um, I'm a first-generation college student. I had no family who was in college before. Um, I think the most we had maybe was I had some aunts with like a CPA. That was it. So. Uh, those of you who are first generation college students know it's it can be hard. It can be hard to, to get through that. And so um uh just want to let you know that yeah, you can you can make make it a long way in academia, um, even at that point, coming from there. So um awesome. Let's talk about the eclipse. Let me get this out of the way. 
we just figured out how to do that <laughs> tonight. It's really exciting. Am I going to do it? Yeah, so um, there's a solar eclipse coming up in October. It should be a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the science of solar eclipses, the history of solar eclipses, and try to just whet your appetite for this event. Uh, the presentation I'm showing to you right now is uh, live on my website. I'm actually showing it from the website. So if you see any pictures or videos that you really like, uh, go to astrodeck.com and you can find the presentation right there. There's a nice blog post about the solar eclipse and you'll find the presentation on that blog post. How many of you were fortunate to see the 2017 solar eclipse? Oh yeah, that's good. All right. Do you remember what that was like? How exciting that was like? Um, I'm gonna get you just get your engines revved up um, and remind you what that was like, that solar eclipse. It's August 21st, 2017. The day of the total solar eclipse. I am in Madras, Oregon. The skies are clear. This is my sky tracker. It's meant to move the camera with the sky. So it sort of compensates for the Earth's rotation. That should help me keep the sun in shot as the eclipse is taking place. <laughs> We have first contact. Uh, this is C1. You can just see the moon entering on the top right side. We are 17 minutes out from totality, and I think the light is starting to change. I think it is getting noticeably dimmer. There's a bit of like a cold uh, wind coming in from this side. Can you guys feel it? It's getting kind of cool, and it's getting darker. I'm really excited. Now that the sun is about 90% covered, uh, I'm seeing much sharper shadows. Normally, shadows, they're a little bit fuzzy because the light from the sun is coming from a whole bunch of locations. But now, because it's coming from basically one little sliver of the sun, the shadows are all getting very, very sharp. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Ah, this is insane right now. Oh, this is just unbelievable. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is happening? This is absolutely insane. I feel like it's hard to breathe. Oh. oh my God. This is so <laughs> totally creepy. Oh my goodness. This feels <laughs> so weird. <laughs> oh my goodness. There's like sunset, sunrise, every direction. People are going nuts. This, I did not expect. I don't know what I expected, but. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> this just looks so wrong. You can see uh, these prominences, the solar corona coming out, the top left and right and the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> I can see uh, Venus directly above me. Oh, what? What is this? What? I just don't even know. It's August 20th. Um, well, <laughs> uh, highly recommend Veritasium, by the way. Anyone seen Veritasium? It's brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. It's such a great, it's such a great YouTube channel. Um, 
uh, he's a, just a great exp explainer. Uh, so uh, fair to say that the uh, eclipse coming uh, in October is not going to be quite as dramatic because <laughs> it's not going to be a total solar eclipse. It's going to be an annular eclipse. It's going to look a little bit like this. So what's the difference between a total solar eclipse and an annular eclipse? The basic difference is not all of the sun's going to be covered up all at once. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about what exactly that means. But this eclipse is called annular because there is an annulus, the sort of ring of the sun that you can see around the edge of the moon. That's very striking to me. When I saw that the first time uh, in, a, in a picture, I thought, that reminds me of something. Reminds me of that. The eye, the eye of Sauron, right? The lidless eye wreathed in flame, the scourge of Middle Earth. <laughs> Sauron, Sauron's eye is sort of this like unfathomably dark, malicious, and empty, right? There's this dark hole at the center. I don't think the solar eclipse is going to be like that, you know? It's really full and it's really rich. There's a lot in there, even though it's this sort of dark, dark black feature uh, in front of the sun. Um, solar eclipses happen when the Earth passes through the moon's shadow. So like all objects in space, the moon casts a shadow. Um, and occasionally, the Earth actually passes through the moon's shadow. Uh, because the moon is so small, though, and so far away from the Earth, it casts a very small shadow. And so that's why, uh, in order to see a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse, there's a very narrow strip along the surface of the Earth where you can actually see that. The moon's shadow is just really small. When the moon is on the other side of the Earth, and the moon passes through the Earth's shadow, then you get a lunar eclipse. Now, because the Earth's shadow is so much bigger than the moon's shadow, basically anybody on the Earth can see a lunar eclipse when it happens. Okay? But for the solar eclipse, the moon's shadow is cast on the Earth, and only a narrow range of folks can see that eclipse. So a total solar eclipse, that's when the, the, the moon's disk as seen from the Earth is at least as big as the disk of the sun as seen from the Earth. And there's this very interesting coincidence um, that, on average, the moon's disk size seen from the Earth is almost exactly the same as the sun's disk size. Total coincidence, but it's really fascinating that it does happen. If uh, you are in a part of the Earth where the moon does not completely occult the disk of the sun, then you will see a partial solar eclipse. And sometimes the moon's orbit is lined up just the right way that nobody sees a total solar eclipse, they only see a partial solar eclipse, okay? So total solar eclipse, sun is completely blocked out, partial part of the sun is blocked out. And then an annular eclipse is kind of like a partial eclipse, except that at some point during the eclipse, the whole disk of the sun sits inside the disk of the, sorry, the whole disk of the moon sits inside the disk of the sun. So that's what you can see in the, in that right hand corner over there. Uh, when that happens, some light from the sun can still make it around the limb of the moon. Okay. Some light from the, the surface of the sun makes it around the limb of the moon, and you see this beautiful ring, this annulus. And so this is what we're going to look for on October 4th um, in about six weeks. What did I say? October 4th. I 14th. Thank you. <laughs> October 4th. October 4th. Uh, so when we talk about a total solar eclipse, we will talk about the um, the track of totality, right? The path of totality. That's where the moon's shadow falls on the surface of the Earth. And folks in that path will see a total solar eclipse. For an annular eclipse, nobody sees a total eclipse. And instead, we talk about the path of annularity. Path of annularity, okay? So that's what it looks like here. I think you can just make this out. Path of annularity uh, basically comes, uh, crosses from the Atlantic, the Atlantic, the Pacific Ocean, um, through Oregon, down through Nevada, across Utah, down through New Mexico, it just kind of kisses the southwestern edge of, of Idaho. So we're not in the path of annularity here in Boise. We're close, but not quite there. It's about three or four hours to the southwest of us. Um, and so we won't, we won't see an, a, a total annular eclipse here in Boise. We're going to see a partial solar eclipse. But it'll be a, a, pretty, a pretty nearly total uh, eclipse from Boise. Um, there's a really great website. I'll link to this at the end as well. Um, this is an interactive uh, Google map where you can actually see the path of, total, of, of annularity, see what time 
different phases of the eclipse will take place in different regions in the Earth. And so if you click on Boise on that map, you see a little picture like this. So there's a little info window. You can see in the top left-hand corner here, this is the latitude and longitude where you clicked. Here's the duration of the annular eclipse, partial, of course, here in Boise. Um, it shows you the uh, percentage of obscuration. So that's, that's the amount of light that the moon is going to block out from the sun. So we're talking about 80, 84%, 85%. That's a lot. It will probably be noticeable here. It is probably noticeable here. Um, and then you can see the ratio of the moon's disk to the sun's disk. Um, here's the key information, the date, of course, and then the time. Now on this map, the time is given in universal time. So it's what time it is in Greenwich, England, right? <laughs> Maybe not so useful here in Boise. Uh, fortunately, it's a little bit of arithmetic. We'll give you the time here in Boise. So you subtract six hours, and that'll give you the time here in Boise. So this eclipse will take place on October 14th, 9.07 a.m. Mountain Time. That's when it starts. It'll reach its maximum at 10.24 uh, Boise Time, Mountain Time, and then it'll end at about 11.47, okay? So it's a, it's a long clip. It's going to take about two hours the whole way through. It'll be most noticeable, though, around 1030 that morning, October 14th. OK, everyone got it? That's the time you want to go look out. How do you observe an eclipse like this? How do you observe it safely? OK, so during the total solar eclipse, there is a short window of time when the moon completely occults the sun. And so for that short period of time, when the moon is completely blocking the sun, it is actually safe to look at the sun without any protection because the moon's blocking the sun. And that's what we saw Derek doing in Veritasum. He's looking up at the sun. That is when it's safe. This is never going to be a total solar eclipse, right? So it's never safe to look at the sun without protection, right? So what do you got to do? What's the way to look at the sun? I'm going to ask my assistant here to tell you how to do that. You can't watch the eclipse with your bare eyes. You got to use special glasses like these or different eclipse aids. These are um, um, United States flag eclipse aids. And um, you can never look at the sun with your bare eyes. Okay, you got it? You can never look at the sun with your bare eyes. Okay. <laughs> so if a, if a, if a four-year-old, a three-year-old can, can explain this to you, then it should be, should be easy for everyone else, huh? So uh, we are going to have clip shades for folks at our on-campus eclipse watching event on October 14th. We have actually purchased some Boise State branded eclipse shades. So if you really want the branded Boise State eclipse shades, we'll have those available. Um, this is a picture actually from the 2017 eclipse. Everyone out on the quad looking at the eclipse. We're going to be out in the intramural field. So that's the uh, big field behind the student union building okay, on October 14th. It's not too hard to find. Um, there'll be a lot of people on campus that day because it's actually Bronco Day. We scheduled the eclipse to coincide with Bronco Day this year. Um, so if you want to get a hold of some of these branded eclipse shades, you can visit that QR code right there or this URL and make a donation, and we'll give you some eclipse shades. So that's how that's going to work. But come join us on October 14th that morning. Uh, we'll talk again about the eclipse, and then we'll go out and watch it. That should be a lot of fun. So the 2017 eclipse was a total eclipse. This 2023 eclipse is a annular eclipse. There's another eclipse coming up next year in April. That'll be a total solar eclipse. The track of the solar eclipse next year is different from the one this year, though. Here's a map showing the eclipse for this year. So here's the eclipse coming up in October. That's the track of annularity. Here's the eclipse coming up in April 2024. That's the track of totality. And you might wonder, wait, okay, so it's the moon blocking out the sun, right? Like, why is it sometimes block out part of the sun and not all of it? Why does the track of the moon's shadow go in different directions? Why are the eclipses always, like, seem like they're different from one year to the next? That's a really good question. Um, one of the reasons for that is that the moon has kind of a complicated orbit around the Earth. And then the Earth has kind of a complicated orbit around the sun. And in order to have an eclipse, you got to get the moon and the sun basically lining up just right 
you got all these moving targets to try to hit. So as a result, you get slightly different eclipses over the course of each year. One of the key reasons why uh, we have eclipses at some times of the year, not others, is because the, the moon has an orbit that's tilted relative to the Earth's orbit. So this cartoon shows how that works. This uh, big plane right here, that's the Earth's orbit around the sun. And then the little plane around the Earth, that's the moon's orbit around the Earth. And you can see that they're not lined up. So the moon's orbit is tilted by about five degrees relative to the Earth's orbit. Now, if the moon's orbit were not tilted and, and aligned exactly with the Earth's orbit, then we would have an eclipse basically the same way, a very similar uh, eclipse all the time. Basically, every six months we have an eclipse. Okay? But because the moon's orbit is tilted, sometimes the moon is above the Earth, sometimes the moon is below the Earth, and that means that the shadow of the moon doesn't always fall on the Earth. So in this cartoon, when the moon is, say, down here, its shadow is below the Earth. And so we can't see an eclipse then because the moon's shadow is not falling onto the Earth. And then over here, the moon is above the Earth. And so the shadow is above the Earth and we don't see an eclipse. And so the only times during the year when you can see an eclipse are when the Earth is here or when the Earth is over here because then the moon's orbit takes the moon so that it can, it can in principle, pass between the sun and the Earth. And that's when we get an eclipse. That's when we get an eclipse. Okay, so that makes, okay, so you don't see an eclipse every month. That kind of makes sense because the moon's orbit is tilted. That's fine. But then you, the question might arise in your mind. Well, okay, so why don't we just have an, like a solar eclipse every year then, right? At least one a year, two year maybe, because it seems like every time the earth is here or here, we should have an eclipse, right? So why don't we have an eclipse every, you know, twice a year? Well, the moon's orbit is not only tilted relative to the earth, but it actually changes over time. The moon's orbit actually changes with respect to the Earth and the sun over the time as a result of gravitational pulls from the Earth and the sun. That actually changes the moon's orbit slowly over time. There's two kinds of changes that we see. One change, we see the moon's orbit wobble like a coin on its end. You know, when, you're, when you spin a coin and right before the coin falls flat, it sort of wobbles around on its, on its edge. The moon's orbit does the same thing. It actually wobbles around like that. This is called precession. This is actually called regression because it goes the wrong way. So the moon's orbit does this because of the sun's gravity and then partly because of the Earth's gravity. But that's not the only oscillation that we see. This oscillation takes 18.6 years to complete. So the moon completes one rotation like this every 18.6 years. Okay. There's another, there's another orbital change that we see for the moon. And it looks a little like this. This is the cartoon showing the Earth which exhibits the same kind of orbital change. Not only does the moon's orbit wobble like that, but the shape of the moon's orbit actually changes over time. So you can see that this, in this cartoon, the orientation of the Earth's axis, the long axis of its orbit actually changes over time. Again, as a result of interactions between multiple bodies. So the moon's orbit does the same thing around the Earth. This is called precession. And so the combination of that regression, that wobble, and then this, and then this, this uh, effect means that we don't always have the same kind of eclipse at the same time of year every year. The moon's orbit is changing. And so these, these various motions, these sort of celestial dances, give rise to this very rich and complex tapestry of eclipses, where sometimes you have one kind of eclipse, sometimes you have another kind of eclipse. And they oscillate together, and they happen to line up every 18.6 years. So these different cycles are beating against each other. And then every once in a while, they line up. And when that happens, you get an eclipse that resembles in many ways the eclipse that happened during the last cycle, 18.6 years ago. And so you can see this tapestry of eclipses illustrated very, uh, I think, visually appealing in a, in a diagram like this. So this diagram shows you years in which an eclipse took place and the month in that year when the eclipse happened. And so you can kind of see, like eye, by your eye, this sort of subtle and complex pattern of eclipses in a plot like this. And if you look very closely, you can actually see the repetition of those similar eclipses every 18.6 years. So 
for instance, if you look here, that eclipse back in February 2008 resembles very closely an eclipse that's coming up toward the end of February in 2026, 18.6 years later. Okay. Another eclipse that resembles two eclipses that resemble one another. Here's an eclipse that occurred again back in 2008 um, at the end of July. And that resembles very closely another one that's going to happen mid August in 2026. Okay. These eclipse cycles are called the Saros cycle, the Saros cycle, this 18.6 year cycle. The, the eclipses recur on that, on that uh, period. For uh, the eclipse coming up in October, the last time we had an eclipse in this Saros cycle was back on October 3rd, 2005. Anyone remember 2005? Was a long time ago, right? <laughs> it seems like a long time ago. So that was the last eclipse in this Saros cycle. We're, the eclipse that's coming up is in Saros 134. So each of the Saros cycles has its own number. This is 134. The, the next eclipse that's coming up is eclipse 44 in the Saros cycle, 134. Got it? There's a test later. <laughs> eclipse 44, Saros 134. And we astronomers now have a very rich understanding of how these eclipses occur. And we can predict eclipses back into the past thousands of years, forward into the future thousands of years. And so we can actually watch this Saros 134 as it unfolds over the course of, thousand, of thousands of years. Sorrow cycles don't last forever. Because these various cycles don't line up perfectly every time, the Saros itself actually uh, evolves over time. And the Saros only lasts for about 1,000 years, 1,200 years, depending on the Saros. But we can look back in time and see what Saros cycle 134 has looked like over the course of that 1,000 year period. So here's a graphic showing the track of the eclipse over the surface of the earth going back hundreds and even thousands of years. And this will repeat. So it goes very fast. <laughs> okay. So this sorrow cycle actually began back in 1284. Sounds a good year, right? <laughs> and you can see it goes hundreds of years into the future. And so you can think about this like cycle of eclipses recurring every 18.6 years it's kind of like like this celestial drumbeat you know it's punctuating human history every 18.6 years the same eclipse occurs gently slowly evolving but recurring a little bit like life right like human history these sort of cycles that we see repeated the last eclipse in this cycle i told you that was on october uh 3rd 2005 Here's the track of that eclipse. You can see it crossed over Africa. So it was visible through Central Africa. You could see a partial eclipse in Europe. What was going on October 3rd, 2005? Well, that year was the year that NASA launched the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, designed to explore Mars. This is the, the spacecraft. Um, and you can see here, it's an enormous spacecraft. It's a beast of a spacecraft. It's still operating, actually. It's been operating since then. Um, it's actually still operating around Mars. Um, and it's returned some of the most amazing observations of Mars we've ever seen. There's a big black um, camera right here. Can you see that? That's the high-rise camera that I mentioned earlier that, that was designed and is run by the Lunar Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona. The high-rise camera is uh, essentially, it's like a spy camera on Mars. It can see uh, features as small as three centimeters. So you could almost read a newspaper on the surface of Mars, if there were newspapers. <laughs> so, read. Um, so no newspapers, but it has seen some pretty extraordinary things. This is a picture. Did anyone see this picture when it came out? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is actually a picture of the descent stage from the, Mar the NASA Perseverance rover as it descended to the atmosphere of Mars. This is the rover that's on the surface of Mars right now that carried the Ingenuity drone. HiRISE was actually able to image this spacecraft descending on a parachute on the way down back in 2021. That's good timing, right? That's how good NASA is. What can I say? <laughs> um, high rise was about 400 miles away from Perseverance and traveling at a speed of more than 6,000 miles per hour when this image was taken. 
So you can imagine trying to thread that needle as an engineer, like you don't want to miss, but it's going to be really hard to hit. <laughs> and this is what was happening during the last eclipse in our sorrows. There have been a lot of really important historical events that took place in the same year as, as eclipses in our sorrows. Um, 1789, there was an eclipse that crossed over the Pacific Ocean. You see right here. So this was an eclipse that may have been observed, observed back in 1789 um, by Polynesian astronomers. Um, Polynesian sailors uh, spread all across the Pacific Ocean, across these, these vast ocean uh, where, where little bitty islands were separated by thousands of miles. Um, and they did it using a very rich and complex knowledge of the night sky in conjunction with other features, water currents and animals, weather features. Um, they managed to inhabit these thousands of islands in the Pacific um, at a time when European sailors were afraid to leave the shore. They were basically moving very closely to the shore. Um, the kinds of navigational skills that were used by Polynesian uh, sailors um, weren't really discovered until later by, by European uh, sailors. So these are really skilled navigators and, and potentially they may have seen this eclipse back in 1789. What else was happening in 1789? The meeting of the Estates General in, in uh, Paris, 1789. Um, this was a big year in France. Um, the Estates General was convened by uh, King Louis the, the 16th uh, in January of this year to, to address the calamitous French national budget. Budget wasn't looking good. The king was trying to raise taxes. The nobles were not about that. And so the king decided to call the Estates General for the first time in more than 100 years to try to arouse the people and get them interested in paying more taxes. You can imagine how well that went over. Um, it was only a few months after this that people were being guillotined in the streets. This was the French Revolution, the beginning of that. This is, this is the echo from the shot heard around the world. Right, right after the American Revolution. So it's probably just as well that Europeans couldn't see that solar eclipse because they were a little busy. <laughs> we're a little busy. People were a little distracted. So these star cycles just keep ticking along, punctuating human history. Sometimes people get to see them, sometimes they don't. Um, but the star cycle uh, has been known for thousands of years. Uh, what was only named the sorrow cycle in the 1600s, in the late 1600s, about 100 years before that revolution we just heard about by this fella. Anyone recognize that guy? How's your, how's your Latin? That's Edmund Haley. Edmund Haley of Haley's Comet thing. You've probably heard his name before. Haley was an English astronomer and sort of polymath um, who lived in the, uh, the, the late 1600s. He's probably the reason that Newton became famous, actually. Newton was a, a famously reclusive uh, natural philosopher at Cambridge who would kind of conduct these secret experiments to learn how the universe worked, but never told anyone about his experiments. He was a very unpersonable person. Haley was the opposite. Haley was a really, a really cheerful guy, an organizer. Like he really got people together. And Haley was the one who encouraged Newton to, to publish his uh, Principia which was the basis of modern science, the basis of modern physics, um, really due to Haley. If, without Haley, Newton probably wouldn't have published it. We would have waited you know, a lot longer for, those, um, for that scientific theory. Um, Haley was an avid scientist scholar, and he had an abiding interest in celestial phenomena, including eclipses. Um, there was actually a total solar eclipse that occurred in his lifetime uh, and crossed through uh, South England uh, in 1715. Uh, Haley predicted the eclipse would cross through uh, a, a, a very densely populated region of England and encouraged the public to observe the eclipse and record their observations so that he could analyze them and learn more about the dynamics governing the eclipse. Um, Haley published this very famous map showing what he predicted to be the track of the eclipse. Um, he was right, very, very, I think he was off by just you know, several kilometers. So he was actually amazingly accurate for prediction at a time when there were no calculators, no computers. He did all this by hand. Um, his, he published this pamphlet to disseminate information about this eclipse, both to encourage people to observe it, but also to, to encourage people not to get scared 
this was a time in human history where people still didn't really understand what eclipses were. Now, scientists understood that they were, but the general populace did not. And he was worried that in 1715, uh, folks would panic when the sun was suddenly blotted out. So he published this pamphlet, it says his wonderful title, The Black Day or A Prospect of Doomsday Exemplified in the Great and Terrible Eclipse, which will happen on the 22nd of April, 1715. Yeah, I mean, we just don't title scientific papers like that anymore. We really should. We really should. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Haley, of course, himself observed this eclipse from London um, and wrote a very detailed, meticulous scientific report. Um, but as you can imagine, he was getting pretty excited as the eclipse was occurring. Um, he might have gotten a little distracted. Uh, and so in his account of the eclipse, he was describing what he could see. Um, he saw the corona, he saw the Bailey's beads, he saw all these phenomena, he didn't know what they were, but he tried to describe them in a lot of detail. So his eclipse, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit from a scientific report. He says, a few seconds before the sun was all hid, there discovered around the moon a luminous ring, about a digit in breadth, that means about the width of his finger. Uh, it was a pale whiteness, or rather pearl color, but the great height thereof far exceeding that of our Earth's atmosphere. But together with contrary sentiments of those whose judgment I shall always revere makes me less confident, especially in a matter whereto I must confess, I gave not all the attention requisite. What is he saying there? He's like, I was a little distracted while this was happening, right? Just like Derek from Veritasium. He's like, I, I was a little bit excited. I had a little bit of trouble paying attention to all the details. So uh, as I said, Haley was the one who coined the term Soros cycle to describe this 18.6 year cycle of eclipses. But he wasn't the one who discovered the cycle. The cycle was likely discovered, or at least was uh, originally recorded by Babylonian astronomers um, going back to at least uh, uh, 1800 uh, BCE. Babylonians were very interested in astronomy and in the motion of celestial objects because they needed to cast very accurate horoscopes. Who were they casting horoscopes for? Not you and me, for the king, for the king. They needed to get those right. And you can imagine what would happen to a Babylonian astronomer if he got the horoscope for the king wrong. <laughs> so uh, Babylonians were meticulous astronomers and they, had, they discovered this 18.6 year cycle of eclipses long before Halley. Um, they also actually observed Halley's comet Back in 164 BC, this is a clay tablet, cuneiform clay tablet um, from, from Babylonian uh, astronomers. Of course, they didn't call it Halley's Comet <laughs> at the time. You didn't know what it was, but they wrote it down. They wrote it down. Um, Babylonian astronomers, uh, they basically gave us many of the constellations we now know. So they were one of the first uh, civilizations to, to point to Orion. They didn't call Orion a hunter, they called him the shepherd. Orion was called the heavenly shepherd or the true shepherd of Anu by the Babylonian astronomers. And just to give you a sense for like how precise and meticulous their observations were, I grabbed this from a, from a paper. This is actually an astronomical paper, probably with a really boring title. Um, but what this is showing is the position of Venus as observed in the sky. And we're comparing here the modern observations, the modern predictions in dark squares to the Babylonian prediction in light squares, and you can see they're off by a few degrees, by a few degrees. And again, these are folks who do not have calculators, do not have computers. They're doing this all by hand. They didn't even have algebra, right? Algebra was invented after this. So they didn't have algebra. They just had these very clever and complex rules for predicting the position of objects in the sky, including these. Um, in fact, one of the first, probably the, the, the first recorded author was a Babylonian astronomer, a priestess uh, named uh, N. Heduana. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. So if you speak Babylonian, forgive me my mispronunciation. This is a, a carving uh, of N. He, uh, N. Heduana. N. Heduana was uh, uh, the, the daughter of the king, uh, Sargon of uh, Akkad. Sargon of Akkad. Um, she was probably appointed the position of, of, of high priestess um, by her father, who else? Um, um, but in addition to being a very accomplished astronomer, she was also a poet. And her poetry became the standard in Babylonian literature for, for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, 
She was a priestess of the moon goddess. And so I want to read you a little poem that she wrote about the moon goddess. I think it's just brilliant. Lady of all the divine powers, resplendent light, righteous woman, clothed in radiance, mistress of heaven with the great pectoral jewels, who loves the good headdress befitting the office of a priestess, who has seized all seven of its divine powers. My lady, you are the guardian of the great divine powers. You have taken up the divine powers and you have hung the divine powers from your hand. You've gathered up the divine powers. You have clasped them to your breast. Like a dragon, you have deposited venom on the foreign lands. When you roar at the earth, no vegetation can stand to, up to you. As a flood descending upon those foreign lands, powerful one of heaven and earth, you are there, Inanna. That's the name, Inanna. So that poem became the standard in, in Babylonian literature for a long time. Other priests were made to copy it down to practice their penmanship. So uh, there were many eclipses that occurred uh, during her lifetime. I couldn't actually find any records of her having seen one, but it's very likely she knew of them, even if she herself didn't actually observe one. Um, and so there's this rich history extending back almost to the beginning of, of time of humans seeing eclipses, recording celestial phenomena. Eclipses are really kind of baked into our bones. It's a, it's a part of, of, of us uh, in the same way that you know, water and air, those kinds of things just are a fundamental foundational element of human history and human civilization. And so as you come to Boise State's campus on October 14th to observe this eclipse, I want you to think about that rich history um, that extends both backwards and forwards in time. Almost as long as you can remember, think of uh, N. Heduana, uh, a Babylonian priestess. Think of Galileo, who observed uh, eclipses and uh, who was foundational, of course, in modern astronomy. Polynesian astronomers who were observing eclipses and recording motions in the heavens to, to safely navigate. Um, rovers on other planets, distant in situ astronomy. And then maybe toddlers who become tweens. Um, and you try to cultivate uh, an interest in astronomy. Maybe it'll maybe it'll blossom someday. And so when you see this dark feature pass over the surface of the sun on October 14th, I don't want you to think about it as being empty, <laughs> not sore on eye. It's rich. It's full. This deep history uh, extending back thousands of years into the past and thousands of years into the future. Um, and with that, I will be happy to stop and take any questions. Thank you very much. I guess that's all right. Lovely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Leave. Is that again? Oh, yeah. The bass event. Do you want to plug it? Yeah. Yeah. But free parking, probably at Kleiner, right? Yeah. So that's one. If you don't want to pay for parking on campus, this is a good option. Yeah, questions. Any questions? Yeah, please. Oh, yes, great. This is good. It's like I planted this question. That's really good. Yeah, that's right. If you look at the sorrow cycle here, let me turn off the light again so we can see this a little better. Um, the symbols are encoded with the type of eclipse with the type of eclipse that it is. And so if you look, uh, the total eclipse is a completely dark uh, circle. That's at the top of the key. Um, and then we have a hybrid eclipse. So a hybrid eclipse occurs because the moon's orbit is changing, remember? And so they, the type of eclipse can actually evolve during the course of an eclipse. And so the hybrid eclipse uh, is shown with the kind of like star symbol inside the circle. Then we've got an annual eclipse that looks like a little target, just like what the annual eclipse is going to look like. Uh, and then a partial eclipse, it looks like a, almost like a crescent moon. And so each of these eclipses, um, they evolve 
right? Because of that, that orbital motion that I described, that orbital precession. Um, and in fact, eclipses within a particular Soros will also evolve from one type to the other because of, because of the fact that those different processional cycles don't exactly sync up. That's the evolution of the Soros eclipse from one, uh, uh, one eclipse in the Soros to the next. Yeah, that's a really good question. Is that, is that what you're asking about? The, the big map, you mean? Let's see back here. Oh, oh, these. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, yes. So these are the um, the the track of of totality or annularity is shown in the little red band. So that's where that's where that track is. And then I think the the full extent north or south is shown uh, in that green that green region there. Yeah, so you're getting to things that I probably can't give you a good answer for. There's a lot of things that go into these these calculations, and I, I admit that I'm not an expert in these calculations. Um, I actually wouldn't be surprised if some of this, yeah, that's right. Good question. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, what it could be is that this is the, the, the red track is probably the track of partiality, and then the blue track is the track of totality. That's my guess. Yeah, I bet that's what it is. Yeah, because you can see that it becomes red toward the end. And these are hybrid eclipses. That's what it is exactly. So the blue is the track of totality, and the red is the track of either annularity or partial or of or, or of annularity. That's exactly what it is. Good. That was a great question. It's almost like I knew the answer to that. Other questions? Why, why would snakes come out during an eclipse? I can think of some, some reasons. They're not good. <laughs> um, yeah, so there, there are these recorded sort of uh, um, observations of animals undergoing strange behaviors. Animals, of course, don't understand what an eclipse is. And so when the sun goes away, they just think that it's nighttime. Um, I don't know why specifically snakes would come out. Maybe that's their hunting time. And so they, they, the sun goes down, they think, oh, now it's time to go hunt. At dusk or dawn? I don't know. It must depend on the kind of snake. Okay. Yeah, I don't know for sure. Um, but yeah, animals essentially, if you have an animal, you probably know. I mean, they, they react very strangely. A lot of animals just think it's nighttime. Um, so yeah, I would guess that the snakes were just confused and thought it was like dusk. Yeah, that's a really good question. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. Go ahead. Oh, will there be a day in the future where we no longer get total eclipses? We are my talk this afternoon. You weren't you missed the colloquium. We talked about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the answer is yes, there will be a day in the future when there are no longer total solar eclipses. Why? Um, the moon is moving away from the earth very slowly. The moon is actually moving away from the earth at the rate of a few centimeters per year, same rate that the, the tectonic plates are moving. And someday the moon will be far enough away from the earth that its disk is always smaller than the disk of the sun. And so someday, it's about 80 million years in the future, 80 million years. So you better watch these eclipses. You don't have that much time. 80 million years. Uh, at that point, yeah, the moon's disk will always be too small and will never completely occult the disk of the sun. And so at that point, we'll never have total solar eclipses again. Yeah. Uh, right. So, so in addition to the processional cycles I described, there's also another long-term evolution of the moon's orbit where it's actually moving farther and farther away on average from the earth. That's the result of tidal interactions with the earth. So those tidal interactions are pushing the moon away from the earth slowly over time. And eventually the moon will be so far from the earth that its disk will be very small and it will never cover the sun's disk completely anymore. And we'll have, no longer have total solar eclipses. Right, but I'm saying like in 2017, we had total eclipses. 
this one was attacking. Right. So in 2017, was the moon. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. No. So, so, you know, it's a really good question. So, the, the moon, I didn't talk about it here, but the moon's orbit is not circular. So, sometimes the moon is farther away from the Earth, and sometimes it's closer to the Earth. And so, when the moon is close to the Earth, that's when you're more likely to have a total solar eclipse because the moon appears bigger in your sky. How many of you saw the super moon this week? See the super moon? Yeah. So, the super moon happens when we have a full moon and the moon is really close to the Earth in its orbit. But sometimes we have a full moon and the moon is far away from the Earth in its orbit. Um, that cycle, that's every month. That's every month. The moon is, moves closer and farther away, closer and farther away, because the moon is not in a circular orbit. But the effect I'm describing, the tidal effect, that causes the average distance to increase over time. Very slowly, but the average distance to increase. So there's all these different orbital motions taking place at once. Um, it's, com it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Yeah, right here. Yeah, so during an eclipse, you can make a pinhole camera. And a colander is a good example of that. You can just use something with, with, a, with a small opening, and it will uh, show you an image of the sun uh, on the ground, for instance, if you put the colander on the ground. So that's a, basically, a, it's a pinhole camera and it's showing you a picture of the sun through that pinhole. Yeah, and you can do it with a colander. You can do it with a box, anything you can make a small hole in. Remember though, don't ever observe the sun with your bare eyes, right? <laughs> I was telling them not to go look at the sun. Other questions? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I'm not familiar with that. I, I guess I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. Haley didn't tell people to go out and look at the sun. He actually told them to do was to time the eclipse. He wanted people to time the eclipse and tell him where they were when they did the timing. That's what he told them to do. So even, even scientists in Halley's Day knew that it was dangerous to look at the sun. How did they know? Because they looked at the sun. Newton actually made himself, Newton actually made himself blind for three days by staring at the sun for like an hour. So they knew very well that staring at the sun was not good for your eyesight. Newton's eyesight actually never really recovered after that. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm sure Haley did not tell people to go look at the sun. He told them to time the eclipse. And by using those timings, and the positions at which the timings were taken, he worked out the, the, the dynamics of the eclipse in that. He didn't tell people to look at the sun, though. So, I'm sorry, say it again. Don't, don't make that sacrifice. We don't need it. We don't need it. <laughs> we don't need your eyesight for science. Other questions? Yeah, one more. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, does the moon's rece recession from the Earth relate somehow to climate change? I don't think it's a direct relationship. Um, that tidal recession is largely controlled by the dynamics of the oceans. Um, so if climate change has an effect on those tidal motions in the oceans, then it could. Uh, I suspect that if there is an effect, it's very small. But... Uh, you know, climate change is a wide range of impacts, so it's not impossible that it would actually impact that somehow. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Great. Well, thanks again, folks. I think we're going to stargaze tonight. So um, if you're interested in stargazing, head out to the lobby and the students will take you upstairs to the observatory. Thanks very much, and we'll see you in October.